Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. You know, our topic today is on apostasy and the heresies that cause it. Most would agree that a falling away from biblical faith is evident. More and more churches have become apostate, teaching doctrines that are not the true gospel. And then there's individuals who profess to be followers of Christ but have succumbed to having tickling ears, and delight themselves in the teachings of other teachers and teachings rather than those of the Bible. Many prefer false teachers these days, renowned celebrities, famous ones, who motivate the flock toward fleshly comforts and unity in good works, rather than seeking the oneness we find in true doctrine, in the Spirit of Christ, according to Jesus' prayer to the Father in John 17. Our Lord desires that we glorify the Father by being one in Him, unified in all of His teachings. So what are the factions and the heresies found among the professing church that cause this falling away from true biblical faith? James Jacob Prash, better known as Jacob, is our guest today to answer some of these vital questions. He's in the studio with us right outside of Philadelphia here. Jacob Prash is the founder of Moriel Ministries International, which reaches hundreds of churches and home churches in many countries around the world. Moriel has also founded missionary ministries that provide help and food to orphans, especially those with AIDS in India. Africa, and in the Philippines. Jacob is a profound teacher who examines the scripture from the original Judeo perspective from the first century apostolic church. He is a conference speaker, video and radio commentator, and author of many books such as More Grain for Famine, Final Words of Jesus, Harpazo, Shadows of the Beast, The Daniel Factor, and more. Moriel Ministries can be found on Roku TV, Jacob Presh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Love for the Truth Radio. Wonderful to be with you. Praise Jesus. Jacob, in the beginning of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, um, it talks about be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. We see here that there are there's an order to uh, what God wants us to do. And I'm going to jump down to 1 Corinthians 11, 18. For first of all, when you come together in church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that which are approved may be made manifest among you. You know, Christians oftentimes associate a heretic or heresy as a, or a heretic as someone outside of the church, usually involved in a cult. But here we see that Paul is talking about believers who are causing factions or divisions among the brethren, and goes on to say that there must be also heresies among you. Why don't we start by defining what heresy is? Okay, well, we have to understand the context of which Paul is speaking. He's hearkening back in part to what he states in chapter 1, some saying that I am of Paul, some saying I'm of Cephas, some saying I am of Apollos. He was speaking about ungodly division in the church where people were putting their leaders on pedestals. Paul picks up on what he introduces in chapter 1 here in this particular chapter, bearing in mind there's no chapter division in the original Greek canon, and he's saying that kind of divisiveness or that kind of division is wrong. Don't put a man on a pedestal. Be a follower of me as I am of Christ. In other words, you can follow me to the exact extent I'm following Jesus. You can agree with what I teach to the exact extent it agrees with the Word of God. You can be like me to the exact extent I'm Christ-like. Well, that applies to any leader. You can be like Jacob Prash to the exact extent he's like Jesus. You can follow him to the exact extent he's following Christ. You can agree with him to the exact extent his teaching agrees with the teaching of, of Scripture. That's what he's saying. He's dealing with this issue of division that he first introduces in chapter 1. But here he goes from talking about that kind of division to another kind of division that is necessary. There must be factions among you to prove which is true. The word here is heresis in Greek, heresis. It comes from a Greek word for schism, schism, uh, to have a split, essentially. A heresy is not a, simply a false doctrine. It is forming a division 
on the basis of a false doctrine. The sin of party spirit can often relate to this. That's decried in other scriptures such as Galatians, the sin of party spirit, where you have factions in the church. That's completely wrong. Where you have rival churches who are looking at their own leaders instead of looking at Jesus. But you have another kind of division here that we're supposed to separate from. We're supposed to separate from those who are heretics, who are teaching false doctrine and making a schism based on it. That if you're not in the club, if you're not believing this, there's something wrong with you spiritually. This can become rather cultic. So the idea of heresy is not simply a false doctrine, although it's popularly used that way. The idea of heresy is the use of a false doctrine to bring about an ungodly division within the church. But then Paul says we have to react against this kind of ungodly division by separating from them. This relates to what he would also address in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 16. There must be factions among you to prove which is true, we're told in Corinthians, but we're told to avoid a divisive man. Well, what does that mean? People today will say, well, if you disagree with the pastor, or you disagree with the leader, or you disagree with the particular teaching that's in vogue, you're divisive. No, that's not what it means. What it means is there's a straight road, a road of biblical truth leading to Christ, leading to his kingdom. But then there's a detour. People stop continuing on that road, and they take a detour onto another road with teachings that are alien to Scripture. The ones who are divisive are not the ones who remain loyal to the Word of God. The ones who are divisive are the ones who take the detour. The problem is, in the last days, that the majority take the detour. Those who stay on the correct road become the minority. But because you're not part of the majority, you're called the divisive one, when in fact they're the ones who have divided. Now, this is the meaning of heresy. They've not only gone into false doctrine, but they've engineered a, divi a division based on it. Well, we are supposed to divide from people like that. There will be factions among you to prove which is true. True believers are to divide from those who go into apostasy, who go into serious heresy. We are meant to do that. The scriptures tell us, come out of her, my people. It doesn't say they're not his people, but those in false religious systems, Jesus commands them to leave. Um, this is the meaning. A division that is induced by a fundamentally false doctrine or doctrines. Okay, give us some examples. Why don't you give us some examples? Okay. Of that? Now, I myself am not a cessationist. I believe the gifts of the Spirit, properly understood and practiced, still exist in the church. The doctrine of uh, cessationism, that the charismatic gifts ended with the apostles, is not scriptural. I believe it is quite false. However, most of the charismatic activity we see in the church today, most of it is not real. It's not authentic. While I do believe in a biblical gift of tongues, I don't believe most tongues we hear today is real. Much of what is being passed off for prophecy today is actually clairvoyance. I'm not denying what's in Scripture. I'm simply saying most of what we see today is inauthentic. We've had counterfeit revivals in Lakeland, Florida, most famously in Toronto, Canada, Pensacola, Florida. Counterfeit revivals that were not of God's spirit. Or if they were, they quickly departed from it. We are told twice in the New Testament, for instance, that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, ikrete in Greek. But we saw people in the Toronto phenomena on the floor out of control, having all kinds of conniptions. You saw people saying, I know it was God, I couldn't control it. By virtue of the fact they couldn't control it, proves prima facie it could not possibly have been God. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. If someone is not in control of themselves, God is not in control of them. I just have to prophesy, hallelujah, when the Spirit of the Lord comes on me, I have to prophesy. So this crackpot money preacher, Jesse Duplantis, tell him I said so. Well, if you have to prophesy, it's not God's Spirit that's on you. The Spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets, Okay. But the people who get into these movements, the Word Faith Movement, or the counterfeit revivals of Toronto, the John Arnott thing, or the, you know, the Kenny and Benny and Joyce thing, the people who get into these things, 
they tell people, if you're not into this, you're not in the move of God. They have departed from biblical doctrine. They've made that detour off the road of biblical truth and are bringing many people with them. But they'll tell you you're the divisive one. No, they're the one who has departed from biblical truth, not the people who remain on the correct road of biblical truth, which is sound doctrine. Paul told Timothy, first words out of his mouth, speak the things fitting for sound doctrine. Now, in the last days, this problem multiplies. It becomes compounded. It becomes exasperated. Wanting to have their ears tickled, people will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. There's a market for the product. The reason people follow word faith money products, uh, word faith money preachers, <coughs> is they're wanting to have their ears tickled. The reason people will follow false prophets is the same reason people will go to fortune tellers. They want to hear what they want to hear. It's all a money-based racket almost. It's a religious racket. It's not biblical charismata. It's not of God. It's a counterfeit. But if, if you speak against it, you're called the divisive one. Or if you don't go with it, if you resist it, you're suppressing the spirit. You're resisting the spirit. No, it's not the Holy Spirit. It is at best the flesh, and very often it is the flesh in league with a counterfeit spirit. That's what's happening in the church in the last days. Now, this is in no way to deny the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit, spirit baptism properly understood and practiced, or the gifts of the Spirit properly exercised when they're genuine. Cessationism is a doctrinal error of the opposite extreme. But charismania, hyper-charismatic mysticism, what you see happening in the church today, the phenomenon of people like Bill Johnson or the IHOP thing with Mike Bickle. These are the false prophets and false teachers Jesus warned would come in the last days to deceive the elect. That's what's happening. It is not charismata, it is charismania, as my late friend, now with the Lord Chuck Smith, used to call it. The biblical term for charismania, for hyper-charismatic extremism and the spiritual counterfeits that accompany it, the biblical term for it, or for ultra-Pentecostalism, is neo-Montanism. Neo-Montanism. They're simply recapitulating the errors of the Montanists in the early church. The Montanists were the people who did the kind of things you read in the book of Corinthians. Crazy prophecies that weren't prophecies, weird doctrines, and combining the superstitions of the pagan world with, with Christianity. Um, the Montanists gained a lot of momentum at one point in the early church, but various forms of it have surfaced at different points in church history. And this is one of them. This is what you see today. Uh, again, these counterfeit revivals over the last 15 to 20 years, this is simply Montanism um, revisited, coming back to us. This is just Satan digging up the same old deceptions that go back to the book of Corinthians. Uh, th that's essentially what's happening. Now, on the other hand, again, I would warn on the opposite extreme, beware of people like John MacArthur, who are teaching against the gifts of the Spirit, and who are saying that these things ended with the apostles. You do not correct error with error. You correct error with truth. People like John MacArthur have become just as dangerous as the extreme charismatics he's warning against. Just as one example, John MacArthur is teaching people Direct, in direct rejection of the Word of God. It will be possible to worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. Cessationism is crazy on one hand. Charismatic extremism is just as crazy on the other. Both are wrong. Scripture is right. We'll be right back with Jacob Presh to continue in more detail on the heretical views of cessationism and charismatic extremism. So stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views from a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please, take everything you hear on this radio program to study and prayer— 
and thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome back. With us is Jacob Prash. He came all the way from England, is with us here today in the studio. He's the founder of Moriel Ministries International. Be sure to look that up. Uh, Jacob, you left off talking about um, extremism and cessationism being some of the forces behind what causes or doctrines that cause heresy. Why don't you begin by defining sensationism for us? Cessationism is the false doctrine that the charismatic gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles or with the (coughs) conclusion, closing of the New Testament canon. It's a completely erroneous doctrine that people try to extrapolate by asegesis, that is, reading something into the text of 1 Corinthians 13. Now, if you were to take their logic, you know, um, the perfect has come. Well, if the perfect has come, we would no longer not only not need tongues or prophecy, we would no longer need faith or hope either, (laughs) because we'll see the Lord perfectly face to face and the hope will have been realized. So if the perfect has come, we no longer need faith and we no longer need hope. It is a ridiculous argument exegetically, completely absurd. When we look at the introduction of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul deals with these issues, he says that you may not be lacking in any charism, charismatic gift, until, until the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, some have tried to say, well, that's the book of Revelation. Once the book of Revelation comes, that's it. No. The word is apocalypsis in Greek, the unveiling. Now, when you read Revelation chapter 1, it doesn't say the apocalypsis. There's not even a definite article. It just says apocalypsis, the revelation of Jesus Christ of what must take place. So the book of Revelation cannot possibly be the revelation. It's the things predicted in the book of Revelation for the return of Jesus that are the revelation, not the book itself. Again, their arguments are exegetically absurd. I have warned repeatedly that people like John MacArthur are as wrong on one extreme as the hyper-charismatic lunatics are on the other extreme. Both are wrong. Both go into very serious doctrinal error, very serious doctrinal error. We see this with John MacArthur saying it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, worship the image of the beast, and still be saved and go to heaven. This was John MacArthur. Now, this is completely, completely crazy, utterly dangerous, and directly contrary to what Revelation chapter 14 teaches. But he's teaching it. But because he's teaching it, people think it's all right. It must be right because of John MacArthur. Well, they're following a man instead of the Lord. The very thing Paul warned about in Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. You can agree with what I teach to the point that agrees with the word of Jesus, not not any further. Once John MacArthur or anyone else, self-included, departs from the word of Jesus, overtly as he did, not a nebulous matter of interpretation, but something as directly as he has done, there are very few charismatics who would say something as crazy or as absurd as what he is teaching and some of his accolades, and for want of a better term, I'm not trying to be rude, but cronies, people like Phil Johnson and people like Jimmy DeYoung, they're teaching this. Now, these are people who are anti-charismatic, but they're teaching a doctrine that's so crazy, even the most extreme charismatics, by and large, wouldn't say something that ludicrous. It is a faction It is a heretical teaching. They've departed from the way. They are just as wrong on one extreme as the hyper-charismatic lunatics are on the other. Neither is biblically true. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're saying here, folks, is that what Jacob is saying here is that even Paul said, you know, just to follow the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we cannot follow man. When we begin to just follow a personality or someone with our tickling ears who we believe is famous or uh, someone that's renowned, that we need to go to the Lord ourselves and, and go before the Lord and follow the scriptures the way that they're saying and put everything against the scriptures, everything that you learn. So what we're talking about, what Jacob is saying is that um, we can fall away from the faith by following certain teachers and by following a, a false Uh, I guess you would say a false opinion of something. Why don't we begin, Jacob, here in 
this segment to at least define apostasy and give us examples, because a lot of people say, okay, uh, I don't believe that you can fall away from the faith. I believe that once you're saved or once you accept Jesus in your heart, that you'll never fall away from the faith. But yet apostasy means to, I believe, depart from the faith or depart from something that you've already believed in. But why don't you give us the The word uh, apostasy comes from the underlying Greek word, Mm -hmm. apostemi, apostemi, to stand outside of. To stand outside of. Now, in the general context of Scripture, the term apostasia in Greek, apostasy, means to depart from biblical truth. There'll be a great end times departure from biblical truth, a great apostasy that will precede the return of Jesus in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, ludicrously, insanely, it is a cessationist, Thomas Ice who says the great falling away, the great apostasy, is the rapture. <laughs> that, that's what he's teaching. Now, other major pre-tribulational teachers, such as Mark Hitchcock, categorically deny this and say it's absurd. Nonetheless, this is what's being taught by these people. Not all of the crazy people are extreme charismatics. Cessationists and fundamentalists can be just as wrong. When you deal with apostasy, it means to depart from truth. There's always been apostates. There's always been apostasy. But in the last days, there's a great apostasy, a great falling away, and we're seeing it now. For instance, I live in Great Britain most of the time. The five largest Protestant denominations that came out of the Reformation, directly or indirectly, Church of England, the Anglicans, the Church of Scotland, Presbyterians, the United Reformed Church, and the Methodist Church, all of them are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. All of them. You're seeing whole movements, even movements that were founded by saved Christians, even movements that were founded by martyrs, Mm. apostatizing, departing from the Word of God in the last days. There's no doubt that what we're seeing now is at least the prelude to what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says is going to happen with the revelation of Antichrist before the return of Jesus. It's shaping up even as we speak. I have no doubt. Hmm. Now, this is not to speculate about the time or the Lord's return. I do not know that. Nobody does. But I do know what the signs say. To have apostasy on this level is unbelievable. Hmm. And the, yes. the momentum and the pace at which it's happened When the counterfeit revivals of Toronto and Pensacola happened, one of the most astounding things was how many people who were previously thought to be biblically solid were taken in by it. I mean, pastors going into it and misleading their flocks into the way of deception. Or people who are always considered to be almost bulkheads of upholding biblical truth. Mm -hmm. People like John MacArthur saying you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved and worship the Antichrist and and still go to heaven. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. gaining momentum. It's people you never would have thought would have done these things or said these things, but they're doing them. Mm -hmm. And others are compromising with it. Now, the world is going down the tubes very quickly. We know that. We see all kinds of things happening that you can't believe it. Um, Talking to someone recently about the White House sending out letters threatening to withhold federal aid to schools and academic institutions if they didn't let the boys who claim to be homosexual share the locker facilities or shower facilities with girls and things like this was unbelievable. But the reason society is that sick is because the church is that sick. Right. The Lord never called politicians to be salt and light. He mm-hmm. called Christians to be salt and light. Right. The reason we have corrupt people in the White House or the Parliament is, or the Congress is because we have so many corrupt people in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. We live in an age of apostasy, and it's getting worse. Yes, it is. And it's people so often we never would have expected 
would have gone down that road, made that detour, departing from biblical truth. That's right. But it's happening. It is happening. And in Matthew 24, the Lord tells his disciple that deception is one of the signs of his soon return. They were to take heed that no man deceive them. That applies to us too. And uh, as we have learned, heretical teachings deceive a person to believe in man's teachings and opinions of the word rather than the true inspired word of God or God breathed word. Uh, Jacob, you did a teaching once on Jesus being 100% God, 100% man, and that many heretical teaching, teachings usually refer only to the soul and flesh or mm -hmm. the physical man rather than the spirit of man. Can you share some of that teaching with us? We are imagio dei beings. We are tripartite. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit because God does. We have a spirit because God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. Whenever God appears in human form in an enfleshment, either as a Christophany in the Old Testament or the incarnation of the Lord Jesus, it's always the Son, never the Father, never the Spirit. But then who has known the mind of the Father? We have a soul, a mind, because God does. We have a body, because God does. We have a spirit, because God does. We are tripartite beings. We are three in one and one in three, because that's what God is. Our nature as a Magio Dei beings, made in his image and likeness, teach about our maker. We are people with three dimensions that reflect the creator, body, soul, and spirit. Um, much of the teaching in the church today is influenced by pop psychology that reduces three-dimensional men and women into two-dimensional ones. In other words, like Darwinism, we're simply apes with better DNA. They confuse the soul and the spirit. This is a very, very deep subject. You mentioned Matthew 24. Deception perpetrated against the elect is not a sign in the Olivet Discourse and Matthew 24, Mark 13, etc. It is the predominant sign. Jesus warned about an increase in wars one time, rumors of wars one time, pestilence one time, famines one time, earthquakes, seismic activity increasing one time, the Jews returning to Jerusalem one time, one time, one time, one time. He warned about deception aimed at the elect four times. That's right. <laughs> Jesus warned about deception within the body of Christ four times more than he warned about anything else concerning what's going to transpire before he returns. Mm -hmm. And it's happening now. It is happening now. And I would like your thoughts, Jacob, on the scriptures on First John 4, 1, 1 and 2. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, many her heretics, or heretics rather, would say, I believe that Jesus came in the flesh. So how do we discern that scripture? First of all, we have to understand the Sitzimleben, the cultural situation and the church situation that the apostle was writing to. We're going to take this on the other side of the break with Jacob Prash. We'll be talking about the scripture, not to believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God and how to do that. So please stay tuned. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. With me is Jacob Presh from Moriel Ministries. Jacob, we left off before the break about your thoughts on the scriptures, 1 John 4, 1, 1 through 2, that says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess 
that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, there are many people, Mary, many heretics would say, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe he came in the flesh. But that's not exactly what this scripture is saying. So how do we discern? Again, looking at the situation, the Sitzim Nabin, the cultural setting and the church situation to which the apostle was writing, he was writing in response to a specific situation at that church at that time, which has application to any church at any time in the same situation. There were incipient forms of Gnosticism that had a false Christology, wrong doctrines of Jesus. They all came from Gnostic origins, but there were variations of them. They had different expressions in different settings and situations in the end of the first century. These things blossomed in the patristic era, in the post-apostolic era, after the apostles, they became major problems, threatening the existence of the church and of biblical Christianity at one point. But even in the first century, it was becoming an issue which God allowed to become an issue so the apostles could give us a foundation to refute it. These false Christologies were docetism. Jesus only appeared to be human. Um, The physical doesn't matter. That's only an illusion. That was one. It came from Greek dualism fused with Gnostic mysticism. Others were... um, Monarchism and modelism, there were different Christologies. There was something called Arianism. Jesus was simply an angelic being. He was not God who became a man. Now, these things come back at different times. Today, we call them United Pentecostals, the Jesus-only people. But in the early church, they were called Sabadians, the Father's Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus. They're an ancient heretic. So too, today we call them Jehovah's Witnesses. They were the Arians of the early church. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a new doctrine. They simply have a repackaging of an old one. All of these false Christologies, that's what he was dealing with. He was not giving the test of a false prophet by saying it's somebody who says that Jesus came in the flesh. That's not the situation he was addressing. We know the situation he was addressing because he goes on from there speaking about what he spoke about in the previous chapter. Antichrist. This is Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to deny an incarnational Christology at some point, or he's going to say that it's him, not not the Lord Jesus. This goes back to what John says earlier in the epistle. Um, That which denies the father-son relationship is Antichrist. Islam, for instance, has a Surah and the Koran uh, engraved on the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, the Mosque of Omar. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. Allah, God, has no son. Or Talmudic Judaism, which denies that Jesus is the eternal son of God. Um, These are Antichrist religions because they deny an incarnational Christology, that Jesus is the Son of God. That is what he's dealing with in the context of the epistle. What these people are doing is taking the text out of context and making it a pretext. The test of a false prophet is found in the New Testament in Peter's epistle, 2 Peter chapter 2, and it's found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18. People who predict things, and in chapter 13, people who predict things that don't happen in God's name are false prophets. That would have to include Rick Joyner. That wouldn't have to include Bill Johnson. I can prove it. That would have to include Mike Bickle and the Kansas City false prophets. These people, Benny Hinn, I can prove all of them have made time-specific predictions in the Lord's name that failed to happen. They're, by biblical definition, false prophets. The other in Deuteronomy is those who point to the worship of another god. Well, that's happening today. People teaching things like Chrislam, trying to unite the god of Christians and Jews with the Allah of Islam, who actually came from the Nabataean moon god, Allah. Um, let's go further with this in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, false teachers and false prophets will come among you. He uses the two interchangeably, and they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, using the Greek word patosogzusin. Why does he, first of all, equate or make false teachers synonymous with false prophets? Because if someone's doctrine is wrong, their prophecies are going to be wrong. 
The reason people like Mike Bickle and Bill Johnson and Rick Joyner make false prophetic predictions is because their doctrine is wrong, according to Peter. But what do they do? Para sozusen. Para is next to in Greek. It's the prefix meaning next to, as in paramedic, paramilitary, something like that. They put truth next to error. False teachers and false prophets put truth next to error. They use things that are true to disguise things that are false. As we always say, there is always real cheese in the rat trap. Oh, but he says some true things. He says that Jesus came in the flesh. He can't be a false prophet. You're taking the text out of context and making it a pretext. You have to look to the co-text. What is John speaking about in the context of the letter? They have to divorce it from the context to make another doctrine out of it. This is what they're doing. We have scriptures which in context plainly tell us how to identify and define a false prophet. And those are found in, in Second Peter. Those are found in, in, in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, that's what these people are doing. They're taking texts out of context. This is the devil's game. When the devil tempted Jesus, he kept taking the text out of context. The whole argument was from Deuteronomy in the temptation of Jesus. It's all from Deuteronomy. For it is written, says Satan. But Jesus said, yes, but it is also written. <laughs> well, these people play the Satan's game. The reason they play Satan's game, we're told in 2 Corinthians, is because they're of Satan. They behave the way he did. He came as an angel of light. He misquoted scripture, not by misquoting the verses necessarily, but by taking them out of context. So his servants, Paul says, will do the same thing. They will come as angels of light, taking the scriptures out of context. When you look at that scripture in context, it's not talking about what they say it's talking about. They play the devil's game because that's who they are serving. Mm, amen to that. And we know in Genesis 3, you know, there's nothing new underneath under the sun. Satan is up to his same old tricks. He usually says, did God really say, as he twists the scriptures ever so slightly. You know, Jacob, can you share with us, you did a teaching on when a truth becomes the truth, it then becomes a lie. And can you just share with us that and give us an example there? For the born again believer in the Lord Jesus, there is one fundamental truth upon which all other truth is predicated. All other truth must be defined in relation to this one central truth. Christ crucified... Christ risen, Christ coming again. That is the fundamental truth. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. Every other truth is predicated, is dependent, is built on that truth, and must be defined and understood in relation to that truth. When you take another truth, even though it may be true, and make it the central truth, the foundational truth, Instead of Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again, even though it may be true, that truth will become a lie. Let me explain. Our ministry takes care of children with dengue fever in the Philippines. We rescue from the garbage dumps, and we take care of AIDS kids in Africa and things like that. Well, that is a truth. We should care for the poor. We should get these children, give them the gospel tend to them, their situation medically and so forth, get them educated, whatever we can do to help them. That is a truth, but it's not the truth. The truth is Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. If you don't have that as the truth, if you're just helping the poor, you have a social gospel. Nobody ever went to heaven because of good works. A lot of people go to hell because of good works, because they trust in their works to save them. No, a social gospel never saved anybody. It is a tragedy that so many once upon a time Christian organizations like World Vision, who began right, have replaced the truth with a truth, simply a social gospel. That's one example. Another is Israel, the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. That is a truth, but it is not 
the truth. The truth is Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. Now, my own family are Israeli Jews. I love Christians who love Israel. I believe firmly in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, but there are people whose faith is based on the purposes of God for Israel. You've got a lunatic fringe in the Messianic movement that are lifting up Jewishness instead of Yeshua-ness, instead of Jesusness. They're putting Gentiles under the law into bondage. They're doing and saying crazy things. They're calling themselves Hebrew roots, too ignorant to know that the Greek word is reza, root. They don't even know what they're talking about. They don't understand that Talmudic Judaism is a false Judaism that rejects its Messiah that Jesus called the synagogue of Satan. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. What do they do? They take the truth and they make it a lie. That's right. There's only one truth. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. If you take another truth, even though it may be true, it is not true in its own right. It is only true in relationship to the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Mm-hmm. I know, Chuck, if we, did, we didn't really talk about this, but I I'm just want to bring this up, is that I know that you would agree that with the ecumenical church culture's quest for unity and peace, doctrine is put aside, like we've been talking about, for the purpose of all getting along. Um, you know, I, I, when I think about that, is that people are still looking to be unified or for unity. And we look at John 17, when Jesus prayed to the Father, that he prayed that we as followers would be one with him, even as he and the Father are one. But yet there's a false unity today. And I, f- I think that that's really huge, that people are uh, putting their doctrines aside to find that unity, especially, like you were saying, into doing good works. I once had a ridiculous conference speaker in the United States, but they were originally from Britain, um, say to me, in defense of ecumenical union with Rome, that Jesus prayed we would be one, citing that scripture. As always, a text out of context and isolation from co-text is a pretext. Before Jesus taught that, his prayer was, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You cannot have unity of the Spirit based on error. Unity of the Spirit depends on the fact He's the Spirit of truth. If it's not scriptural, it's not God's unity. We're going on a break, so please stay tuned for the conclusion. We'll be right back with Jacob Prash. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. We're back with Jacob Prash. We've been talking about heresy, heresies that causes apostasy. And as Jacob said before, that when a truth becomes the truth, it then becomes a lie. So we can't take any one part of the Bible and build the whole doctrine upon that one part. And that's basically what he's saying. So we're going to move on here, Jacob. Um, I want to talk a little bit about mysticism. I think it's huge huge today. A lot of people that are in churches are uh, basing their truth on experience. Okay. And we know that mysticism uh, is not really part of, well, it's not at all part of the gospel truth. We are led by the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth and understanding according to the witness of what is said in the Bible. But we look at mysticism. The first thing that I think of is that people are being led by a different spirit. So why don't we talk a little bit about mysticism? Mysticism, plain and simple, is pseudo spirituality. 
It is a function of the soul that is usually demonically influenced, not directly by necessarily possession, but by deception. The devil gets people to believe something nonsensical, thinking it's scriptural or true, and it becomes an emotionally experienced event in their lives that they believe in. I'll give you an example. No place in scripture do we ever see a demon being cast out of a born-again believer. Christians can be demonically oppressed, but the word there is therapeo. Christians are healed from demonic oppression. The word ekbalo, cast out, exorcism, is never used for a saved Christian. And all of the instructions the apostles give and write under the Holy Spirit, and we're told that Scripture is sufficient for what we need to know um, to live a Christian life, Um they teach a lot of things about dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil. No place did the apostles ever teach casting demons out of believers. In fact, the term deliverance does not even mean that in the original Greek. You only see demons being cast out of non-believers. Now, I would say an unrepentant backslider could become demonically possessed, but saved Christians can only be oppressed, requiring therapeo perhaps, but certainly not ekbalo, not exorcism or deliverance or whatever these people are teaching. But you see people will stand there and shake, and the, and the deliverance minister saying, come out of him, you devil, come out of her, you devil, and they, they manifest. <laughs> First of all, it's very dangerous to confess that you have a demon inside of you. You're giving them a key. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. A demon cannot occupy the same place if you have God's spirit. A demon can invade the body, can invade the soul, but not the new creation. They cannot touch the spirit, the new spirit that is put in us at second birth. Well, why are they manifesting like that? They're basing the doctrine on experience. What it is is a combination of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. It is hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. It is pseudo-spiritual, but they think it's real. They think it's biblical, but it certainly is not. I always tell people, when you see a church that has a deliverance service, do what I do. Pick up the telephone and give them a call. You have a deliverance service tonight? Good. Send over two cheeseburgers with raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. It's, but they believe it. This is mysticism. The counterfeit manifestations of the Holy Spirit in these counterfeit revivals, again, going back to Toronto, Canada, and so forth, with John Arnott or the phenomena of Rodney Howard Brown. This is mysticism. It is (coughs) pseudo-spirituality. This comes into the doctrinal and theological realm in a form of Gnosticism where they spiritualize text of the scripture out of context. Mysticism is always a counterfeit of genuine spirituality. For instance, fortune telling is a counterfeit of predictive gift of prophecy. Witch doctors speak in tongues in Africa. They all do it. Um, It's a counterfeit, okay? Um, Well, so too, you, you, you see, mysticism is always a counterfeit of spirituality, Gnosticism is a counterfeit of biblical typology and and midrashic hermeneutics, (coughs) things that are scriptural. Um, In Kabbalah, mystical Judaism, you have numerology. That's a counterfeit of something that's valid called gematria, the biblical use of symbolic numbers and so forth and acrostics. These things always counterfeit. They always try to look like what's biblical. So the undiscerning or the untaught won't know the difference. They won't know the difference between spiritualizing a text out of context and a genuine use of typology. For instance, the Paschal Lamb is a picture of Christ. The Lamb without blemish is a picture of a sinless Jesus. That's valid symbolism. But you get people making doctrines out of symbolism. No place does Scripture ever base a doctrine on symbolism or midrash, even though the Scriptures con- con- contain midrash and symbolism. This is Gnostic. It's mystic. When hermeneutics come into the church doctrinally, I'm sorry, when a mysticism comes into the church doctrinally, that's known as Gnosticism. It's always a counterfeit. The gifts of the Spirit are counterfeited. 
biblical exegesis becomes counterfeited, and authentic Holy Spirit experience becomes counterfeited. It's always a counterfeit spirituality. Mm-hmm. Now, Jacob, you said that uh, that Christians cannot be demonically, well, you said they can be demonically oppressed, but they're, they're not possessed. Correct. All right. Now, we're talking about apostasy. Now, is it possible for someone to fall away from the faith because of heresy and then be following doctrines of demons or being uh, demonically possessed at that point? I believe that an unrepentant backslider can become demon-possessed because, as with King Saul, there was a point where the Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit left him. Now, I don't think if somebody sins, the Holy Spirit leads them. I think the Holy Spirit, the scriptures say the Holy Spirit is grieved. But when you have somebody who departs from the truth and goes into out-and-out apostasy, Mm -hmm. um, they do open the door to a demonic possession. Satan can use people like that tremendously. Mm -hmm. Satan can use an unrepentant backslider tremendously. But somebody, even a weak Christian, even the weakest Christian, Mm -hmm. even Christians with all kinds of problems in their lives, including battles with recurrent sin, they still have the spirit of the Lord. They cannot be possessed. That's right. Now, Jacob, what I would like to do now is we've talked so much uh, about uh, the different heresies or the different types of uh, teachings, false teachings that can lead one to fall away from the faith. Now, I, I'm sure there's many out there that are listening to this and say, gee, I'm a little bit confused. We talked about so much here. Can you just kind of wrap up or in conclusion? Okay. First of all, the falling away from the faith because of false doctrine, that's commutative. It's not just people fall away from the faith because of false doctrine. Paul says, wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate teeth the corners of their own desires. They go after the false doctrine because they're falling away from the biblical faith. <laughs> they're not satisfied with what's in the Word of God. It's not just that the false doctrine is misleading them. It is that they are already departing from the Word of Truth, therefore they follow in error. Remember what Paul says about the leaders who mislead them. They are both deceiving and being deceived. People like Joyce Meyer, Paula White, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, they are both deceived themselves as well as being deceivers of others. They are both deceiving and being deceived. And again, their numbers multiply in the last days, ultimately culminating with the advent of the Antichrist and false prophet. So if we have we have people here that truly want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, truly want to follow after his truth, you know, in prayer, and not really go running after a personality or running after a teacher who, you know, with tickling ears, then you believe that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide them. He who is mm-hmm. able to keep you. Even if you're a new believer, you don't know a lot of scripture, if you love Jesus, no one can snatch you out of his hand. That's not to say you can't jump out, but no one's going to snatch you. Jesus, don't let me be deceived. Help me to understand your word. You say that, you mean it. He's not going to let anybody deceive you. If you get misled, he's going to show you, even if you're a young believer. If you love Jesus and you're trusting him, You can trust him. He's not going to let anybody sell you a bill of goods. You might buy into it in your ignorance, but somehow, providentially or otherwise, God's going to show you this is wrong and get you out of it. That's right. And you know know what? Let's just say this, uh, Jacob. There's a lot of churches out there, and I know that you would agree they're in a apostate uh, condition right now where they have already fallen away from the faith or teaching a false gospel. But then you have a, a believer who loves the Lord and they're going to that particular particular church and they're hearing some truth but half lies, but they don't know what the lies are. What do they look for in a church or in a pastor to discern, should I be here or not? Paul says, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Is what they are teaching and doing in agreement with what Jesus did and taught. That's ultimately the test. Now, they'll try to tell you it is, but when you challenge them on the basis of Scripture, they can't support that. Mm -hmm. They can't support that. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of people that need shepherds. I mean, there's those that are leaders, but there's those who are followers that need the shepherd to lead them and to be good examples. So yeah. let's, let's define what a good example looks like in a pastor or a leader. First of all, he's, he's called to be a pastor. 
Some some are evangelists, some are are, are, are prophets, some are, are pastors. And you talked about three different shepherds yes. too in some of your teachings. That's right. Mm-hmm. He's called to be one. Secondly, remember, no matter what church you go to, if it's a faithful church, a true church, Jesus is the pastor. The pastor you see in the pulpit is the assistant pastor. I don't care if he's a pastor of a mega church with fifteen thousand people. God bless him, but he's only the assistant pastor. Jesus is the pastor of every congregation of true believers. You can only trust that guy in the pulpit to the exact extent he's trusting and following the Lord Jesus. God uses men like that, and the faithful ones, may God continue to bless them and use them. Pray for them. They need your prayers. Satan attacks them more than he attacks anybody most of the time. Mm-hmm. And then the word talks about that you'll know them the, yes, by, by their, their fruit. fruit. Of course. What does the fruit of look course. like? Of course. But mm-hmm. never, ever, ever put a man in the place of Jesus. Mm-hmm. That is Antichrist. That's the Greek meaning of the word Antichrist, yeah. not yeah, just against, right. but in place of. Mm-hmm. The Roman Pope of Rome is a classic example, actually calling himself the Holy Father. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, call no man on earth your father. One is your father who's in heaven. Yet this guy, who when he was the cardinal in Argentina, refused to meet with sexually abused children, victims of priests, mm-hmm. or who says, if two men are in a same-sex relationship, who am I to judge? And he calls himself the Holy Father? Acting and teaching directly contrary to the word of God. He doesn't have a shepherd's heart. He didn't care about those molested kids or their families in Argentina where he was the cardinal in Buenos Aires. And he calls himself the Holy Father. He's putting himself in the place of God. That's right. And no one is to be called father anyway. Nobody. That's right. Now, you talked about that there were three different types of shepherds, I believe, in one of your teachings. Based on John 10, we see three different kinds. Mm -hmm. There are good shepherds who are like Jesus. These are people that if the situation arose, they'd lay down their lives for the sheep. I work, and shouldn't talk about this, I work in certain countries where the church is persecuted. There are good shepherds who do that. Then there are bad shepherds who are wolves in sheep's clothing. They have an agenda. Most pastors are neither good or bad. Most of the third category, hirelings. They're in the ministry for a job and a living. We'll be right back with Jacob Prash, so please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for Love for the Truth Radio Philadelphia. Look us up on lovefortheTruthRadio.com. We air programs via stream every day. You can find program archives uh, with contributors John Haller, Chris Quintana, Carl Tycrib, Patrick Wood, guests like Bill Koenig, Ray Youngin, Johanna Michelson, Bill Salas, and Jan Markell, and many more veterans of the faith with the voice of truth. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Rapture Ready Radio on Monday evenings on Blog Talk Radio with Jackie Alnor, along with numerous web radio programs who air us on their stations worldwide. Lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Welcome back. We're with Jacob Prash. And Jacob, thank you so much for sharing a wealth of information with us. And I know that in this last segment, very quickly, we really need your advice. But you, I want you to finish up what you were talking about, the shepherds, because I think people need to hear this. And you know, people out there, I know that Jacob talked about a lot of different heretical teachings teachings and heresies that's in the church today. That's why the church at large, our church culture, is in a, an apostate condition, a falling away from the faith. There are many that say they're saved, but their their lives don't add up to that. A lot of them are still living a lifestyle of sin or agreeing with a lot of the sin that, that Bib- the Bible speaks against. So we know that we're in that kind of condition today. So Jacob, why don't you finish up with what the, the different types of shepherds there are? But I do want you to end with giving some kind of advice to the people who have heard what you had to say today. Okay, first of all, a good shepherd. In the Hebrew text, Yehoah ro'i lo exar. Yahweh is my pastor, I shall not lack. That's what it says. A good shepherd, a good pastor. The Greek word for pastor 
is the same as the word for shepherd. It could either be poeon or episcopo, the one who looks out, epi, over, okay? A good shepherd is like Jesus. If necessary, he will lay his life down for the sheep, which happens in Islamic and communist countries today, and it's always happened, and in the last days it will happen. That's a good shepherd. Then there's the wolves in sheep's clothing, bad pastors. They're just there to fleece the sheep. Then there's the third category, what Jesus called in John 10, hirelings. Their priorities are not the Lord or the sheep. Their priorities are their salary, their pension, their accommodation and housing allowance, their status within the denomination, their credentials, their position in the community or the church or something like that. If the ministry is their career, they're hired. Now, how do you tell if your pastor is a hireling? Most pastors today in the Western world are not good pastors, and most are not bad ones. Most today have seemingly become hirelings. How can you tell if a pastor is a hireling? Jesus tells us directly. If you will not protect the sheep from the wolves, if he will not teach you about false doctrine, if he will not tell you why you shouldn't get involved with people like Mike Bickle or Joyce Meyer or Bill Johnson or or Rick Joyner or these deceivers or these money preachers on TV— If he will not protect the sheep from the wolves, he's a hireling. He wants to avoid controversy. He wants an easy job. Well, it's not an easy job. In fact, it's not a job. It's a calling. It's a burden for the sheep that the Lord has put on you. Now, we've talked a lot about error. Let's talk about the opposite side. You have a pastor who's a man of God who faithfully preaches Jesus, who expounds the scriptures, who loves his flock, You pray for that man. You stand by that man. That laborer is worthy of his hire. He's being attacked in ways most people couldn't imagine. Strike the shepherd as with Jesus, the sheep will scatter. Stand by good and faithful pastors. There are good and faithful pastors in the body of Christ today. We've talked about a lot of bad people by name because there was a need to name them as the apostles named them. But there are good people. There are people today who are still teaching the truth, even in this age of darkness and apostasy. You have a man of God standing in that pulpit who loves Jesus and loves the sheep, who teaches the truth and preaches the true gospel. He needs and deserves your prayers and your support and your loyalty. Amen, Jacob. Jacob, how can people get in touch with you? Moriel.org is our website. Moriel, M-O-R-I-E-L.org. Please visit us. Also, you can watch us on Moriel TV. Just Google it. Thank you, Jacob. It's been a pleasure having you on Love for the Truth Radio. Thank you, audience, again for listening. God bless.